So a friend of mine calls me up and says, hey, I've got this old table. You think you want to make one of your little videos about it? And I was like, sure, bring it over. And the table arrives and I think, oh, oh this is nice. A little drop leaf table, probably 1890s, probably locally made, not bad, but not super interesting. At least not from this angle. Hold on. It's when you get underneath it that things get interesting. These drop leaves are held open by a really interesting wooden hinge. I've never seen it before. And the turned legs are nice, they're, they're fine. But the really fascinating part is if you get under it and you look up. Up under the table, there are five strips of oak, really precisely made, bolted to each side of the table. And it's not immediately clear what they do, but of course, there's a split right in the middle. So I'm thinking that this is an expanding table. So if I set it up and grab one end, kind of like this, and I pull, whoa, what the? Okay, I admit, I was expecting something but I was not expecting this. Last year, I looked at a really similar piece of furniture, a drop leaf space-saving table with turned legs. But that piece of furniture was much lower down the ladder than this one. It was clearly made by a country carpenter, somebody of moderate skill, and he was building it for a middle-class client. This table is something really different. It's a big step up. This was made by a more skilled artisan, and it was clearly for a higher class, wealthier client. And you can really see that in the details. Where last year's table was just a plain square, this one has a lovely oval shape. And that oval is even more impressive because the table top is divided into four segments, and all the curves that make up the oval connect smoothly, even though they're broken up. That's not easy to do. And then the edge of last year's table was just a plain 90 degrees with no decoration. This one is beveled smoothly and evenly across the entire edge. That's not super easy to do, especially on the end grain of boards like this. To do that and execute it really crisply, you've gotta be skilled. Now, these decorative touches can be especially well seen down on the legs. Everything about these legs is skillful and they were probably made using a multi-step process. First, the maker would have squared up the leg stock and then probably cut the joinery up here on the ends. Then the whole piece would have gone over to the lathe for cutting these round details in the middle, and there's another one down at the bottom. Now, those details don't just make the piece look nice, and they do, they're very well executed, but they also make it possible to cut this octagonal section down here. This is kind of a nod towards a classical Greek style. It would have been very classy at the time. Very difficult to cut unless you make the piece narrower right here. By doing turnings at either end, it's possible to come in with a plane, just like this, and then cut those narrow facets without messing up the thicker part up at the top here. You can even see on this leg that when this one was turned, the maker actually put a little bevel or notch on these corners, which makes it even easier to come in with that plane and cut those details without messing up this nice, crisp square section. This whole leg would have been a multi-stage process, which means a lot of time. And time and multiple steps, that equals money. Now, as impressive as all the decorations on this table are, it's the mechanical elements that are really nice. This is a drop leaf space-saving table, just like last year's, and it's got the same fancy joint right here. But it's the way the leaves are held up that's really different. On last year's table, the leaves are suspended with this simple pivoting arm that's cut directly out of the table apron. This example is completely different. When you lift the leaf up, you find this plain apron here with this box joint looking thing cut right here. And then there's a lip that you can grab and as you pull this out, you can see that this apron is actually a false apron attached to the structural one. And it's got this really impressive sort of knuckle joint hinge cut right in here. It's a five piece box joint with a wooden pin traveling all the way through to let it pivot. A joint like this is not easy to cut. 
It's really similar to a dovetail, and it takes a lot of attention to measurements and angles to make it look good and actually make it work. I made one for this video, and next week I'm going to have a complete tutorial to show you how to cut every aspect of this joint so you can add it to your own projects. Don't forget to hit that bell icon so you don't miss it. And if we're going to talk about clever engineering and stuff like this, well, I guess it's time for us to talk about those expanding slides. Okay, I know that I am an enormous nerd for vintage furniture, but you've got to admit, this is legitimately cool. These are 10 individual slide pieces, five on each side, and they allow this table to expand an additional 58 inches. When it's all folded up, this table is only 28 inches wide, but when it's fully extended with the leaves up, it's almost 10 feet long. That is really impressive, and it does make you kind of wonder, who would have needed a table like this? I mean, fully collapsed, it's like an occasional table. It sits on the side of the room, and then fully expanded, it would have been a formal dining table. This is for somebody who would have had big parties of people over at their house, but only occasionally. That's more evidence that this was made for a pretty rich client. And then, of course, to fill in on top of these slides, you would have had drop-in leaves, individual pieces of tabletop that would have been made to fit in between these slides. And there are Roman numerals on the edges of the table that we do have. There's a Roman numeral 1 right here and a 7 over there. So I think there were six individual leaves that dropped in here, and that would have made it possible to make the table a bunch of different sizes for however many guests were coming over. Now, of course, we have to talk about the slides themselves, and they are a curiosity. They're very different than the rest of the table. For one thing, they're made of oak, where most of the table is made out of sycamore. And then the way they're cut and made, it just doesn't look like handwork at all. There's a pretty sophisticated T mechanism that allows these to slide back and forth, and I don't really see a good way to cut that with hand tools. I talked to a furniture restorer about this table, and he said, yeah, sometimes these were cut by hand, but I have to be honest, I don't see how. And then earlier in the day, I was waxing these slides so they'd work a little bit more smoothly, and the wax revealed a really characteristic scalloped pattern on the surface of the wood just like you would get if you ran a piece of wood through a machine planer. So I really think this part of the table was made on some sort of machinery, an early shaper or some kind of milling machine. And then whoever made the table might have bought them from somebody else, maybe even bought them sort of as a kit. It all brings up the interesting question, though. Exactly how much of this table really is handmade? Well, most of it, for sure. This table is covered with signs of handwork. There are layout lines where the mortises are cut. There are saw cuts where the hinges are inlet. The top is attached to the apron through some of the roughest gouged out pocket holes I have ever seen. They are really rough. Everything about this table says handmade, but of course, that doesn't mean there were no machines involved anywhere. This table was made around 1890, and by then, the Industrial Revolution was well underway. Machinery was creeping into every single field, even handmade furniture. So a table like this, that was probably mostly made using hand tools, still probably had some machined components. The stock might have been machined flat at the mill. Those slides, I really think those were made on some sort of machine. And of course, the legs, well, they might have been done on an old-fashioned spring pole or a treadle lathe, or they could have been jobbed out to somebody who had a powered lathe and could do work like this at a high volume. I think it's really likely that whoever made this table incorporated some machine-made elements for the same reasons that anybody would do that. Efficiency. Everything about this piece suggests a maker who was really focused on efficiency. All of the show surfaces are beautiful, and they were very carefully prepared. But everything that you can't see got zero attention. If you look on the insides of the table aprons, you can even see original saw marks from the circular sawmill that cut the wood from the tree. If you couldn't see it, this craftsman didn't do anything to it. Now, we also see efficiency in little details like the pulls for that hinged leaf support. You need a way of thinning that board out so your fingers can get up inside of it, but the craftsman did it the quickest way possible. He just draw knifed in this fast recess. It's effective, but nobody wasted any time on this detail. 
especially because you can't see it. Now we can also see efficiency in the wood choices. This thing is made almost entirely out of sycamore. That's a local wood, it thrives in wet conditions like we have here in northern Ohio. You don't find it in tons of places in America. It's this big tree beard, knobbly looking thing. I took this picture in my neighborhood. We have them all over the place. And sycamore is a quality wood, pretty hard, pretty easy to work. Looks like maple, but very economical. Even today, it's a lower mid-priced wood, really good for the home craftsman. What's interesting is that even though the craftsman used an inexpensive wood, he still used as little as humanly possible. It looks like the whole table is made out of that sycamore, but really, it's only the parts you can see. Two of the table aprons are hidden by those hinged portions that support the leaves. And just on those two table aprons, just those two spots you couldn't see, the craftsman replaced sycamore with softer pine, which would have been cheaper. And that's fascinating because that's like 10% of the wood in the whole piece. But whoever made this table saw that was a chance to save just a little bit of money, probably pennies, and he still snuck in some cheap softwood. That tells us that this is somebody who was operating on razor thin margins. If he could save one cent on something, he did it. So this table is 130 years old. How's it holding up? Well, mostly it's good news. The top is still flat, the legs are straight, the aprons look nice. It's pretty good overall. But I have to be honest, there's a pretty significant flaw. All of the mortise and tenon joints that join the aprons to the legs they all show loosening and separation. There's gaps here at the shoulders. The joints are just coming apart. And I think it's obvious why. When this table was made, the maker relied entirely on glue to hold this joint together. Now, if you're making a really small decorative table, like this little shaker end table that I made earlier in the year, well, you can just use a glued mortise and tenon joint for that. That table's not gonna be under a lot of stress. It's gonna hold together just fine. A table like this is totally different. It's much larger, it's being pulled apart and pushed together, it's being moved all the time. It is under a ton of stress and you cannot count on glue in a situation like that, even modern glue. The joint is just, well, there's too much going on there. Now, for centuries, mortise and tenon joints were assembled without any glue. They were made using a process called draw boring, which is where you drill a couple of offset holes through the joint and then drive a pin through them. And that pin would force the joint together and give it a mechanical interlock. So it was just about impossible for it to come apart. Here I am demonstrating the technique in an earlier video. Now, why wasn't this table drawboard to make it last longer? Part of it might have been efficiency. The maker maybe just didn't feel like he had to. He felt like his joints were tight and they were glued so they'd be fine. But the other thing just could have been fashion. I mean, the mortise and tenon with the drawbore showing, with the pegs on the outside, well, that was probably seen as being kind of an old-fashioned 1700s way of doing things. This more modern style, late in the century, they were looking for a clean look, something that was more up-to-date. Of course, you could still get a more solid joint while keeping that clean look. You could go around behind, inside the leg here, and put some pins in. And I think it would be worth pinning the joint from the inside. The separation of these joints, it's been a problem for a long time. You can see putty inside some of them where they tried to fill in the gaps, which obviously didn't work at all. And there are also glue blocks nailed to the inside corners where someone was trying to hold it together. These joints have been separating for a long time. It's not a recent thing. And if we were gonna build this table over again, well. I love doing things the old fashioned way, but this apparently was a little too old fashioned, or maybe it was the wrong kind of old fashioned. We'd wanna update this for modern furniture building. So this table looks really traditional to the modern eye, but really, this is a skillful blend of tradition and innovation. Tradition in the mortise and tenon construction, in the turned legs, but also innovation in the incredible engineering, that knuckle joint, those slides that let it open and close so smoothly. The fact that this could have served a number of different functions in a busy, high-class household, and the fact that the maker probably combined handwork with machine-made components. We look at this and we see something old-fashioned, but that's not really what's going on. This table was made during a period of incredible change, of huge upheaval. 
a period a, a lot like the one we're living now. And just like the makers back then did, we can include all of those changes in our work. I am all about making traditional, sort of old style furniture. It's just what I enjoy. But that doesn't mean I won't update anything. It doesn't mean I'll never use a machine or a piece of modern hardware. It doesn't mean I won't pin my joints if it means they're gonna stay together. I'm gonna to do all of that stuff. And I think you should too. It's great to be informed by tradition, but we can see from this table, there's no need to be a slave to it. Innovation is right at home in a piece just like this. It's right at home in any of the pieces we're gonna build. And listen, if you're not ready to innovate yet because maybe you haven't even started your woodworking journey, I've got something to help you out. My new book is called Everyday Woodworking, and it is a complete, concise introduction to woodworking using 12 inexpensive hand tools. It is a total from the ground up approach. So if you've never done any woodworking before, my book's gonna get you started. You can grab it anywhere you get books and it is in stock for the holiday season. So you know, maybe get in on that Christmas shopping a little bit early. And just like usual, these videos would never be possible without my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to be one of those people and get a lot of rewards, go on over to patreon.com slash Rex Kruger and check out all the stuff we do for the people who make these videos possible. I'll be back next week with that knuckle joint hinge video. I'll teach you everything about how to make it. It is gonna be a lot of fun. Don't miss it. I'll see you next week.